The question of abortion divides Americans. Are you for it? Are you against it? Are you for it under some circumstances, but against it in other circumstances? What about the recent Supreme Court ruling in the case, a very controversial ruling? What have you heard about it? Is the ruling good? Is the ruling bad? How should we think about it? In the case of Dobbs against Jackson Women's Health Organization, the Supreme Court of the United States overturned its 1973 ruling in Roe versus Wade. That ruling had created a right to abortion through six months of pregnancy and even beyond. The Dobbs decision, though condemned by those who today call themselves progressive, was correct. Roe needed to be reversed. I say this for the simple reason that the so-called right established by Roe lacked any basis in the text, logic, structure, or historical understanding of the Constitution. A majority of justices in Roe had manufactured it out of thin air, essentially amending the Constitution by judicial fiat, something courts are not permitted to do. The dissenting justices in Roe said this. All constitutional scholars knew it, and several notable progressive scholars and jurists admitted it. For example, the late John Hart Ely, a progressive constitutional scholar at Harvard Law School, who went on to be dean of Stanford Law School, condemned Roe v. Wade in the harshest possible terms. In an article in the Yale Law Journal, Ely, who was personally in favor of a policy of permitting abortion, declared that Roe, quote, is not constitutional law and gives almost no sense of an obligation to try to be, unquote. So what exactly did the court do in the Dobbs case? Unfortunately, the public has been fed a pack of lies, not only by partisan activists, but by many in the media. Let me provide the facts. The court in Dobbs did not ban abortion. Yes, you heard me right. Contrary to what you might innocently but incorrectly believe, based on what you've heard from people professing themselves to be outraged by the decision, the Dobbs case does not make a single abortion illegal. What then did the court do? Well, Roe had made abortion through at least six months legal through the United States by taking away from the American people and their elected representatives the power to protect developing human life in utero by banning elective abortions. That is, abortions that are not required to avert a threat to maternal life. What Dobbs did and all that the case did was to return the authority to decide whether to protect the child in the womb, and if so, how and when, to the people and their elected legislators. The case simply acknowledged the manifest and undeniable fact that the Constitution does not forbid the American people, if they choose, to protect unborn human life, where pregnancy poses no threat to the mother. Some states, Idaho, for example, Missouri, Louisiana, will choose to protect unborn children. Others, such as California, New York, and Illinois, will go in a radically different direction, permitting abortion at any time throughout pregnancy for any reason. Many will take a middle position, following Denmark, Belgium, Switzerland, Finland, and many other European countries in allowing elective abortion up to, but not beyond, 12 weeks, a position far less extreme than what the Supreme Court imposed in Roe v. Wade. You may be wondering what provision of the Constitution the Supreme Court invoked back in 1973 to create a right to abortion in the first place. The answer is the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. This provision forbids states from depriving any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Now, of course, this provision has nothing to do with an alleged right to abortion. What it means is what it says, namely, that in enforcing their criminal laws, states may not execute people, depriving them of life, send people to jail or prison, depriving them of liberty, or subject people to monetary fines or forfeitures, depriving them of property, without giving them a fair trial, including such traditional notions of fairness in our law as the presumption of innocence and the need for an independent and impartial judge who is not also serving as the prosecutor. This so-called reading of the Due Process Clause, which is transparently nothing more than a manipulation of the provision, did not begin, nor did it end, with Roe v. Wade 
It was first adopted by the Supreme Court to create a right to slavery in the notorious 1856 case of Dred Scott against Sanford. It was then used by the court in another infamous case, Lochner against New York, which in 1905 struck down state laws protecting the health and safety of workers in industrial facilities. When Lochner was overruled in 1937, people thought that what was known as substantive due process had finally been discredited and buried. But it was revived to produce Roe less than 40 years later, and since then has been used by some justices on the Supreme Court to strike down laws against homosexual sodomy and to manufacture a so-called right to same-sex marriage. Some critics of the Dobbs decision are claiming that the case not only undermines the foundation of those last two cases, but also the 1964 case of Loving v. Virginia, which struck down laws put in place by racist Southern Democrats to forbid marriages between people of different races. But this is false. The Loving decision rested entirely correctly on the 14th Amendment's equal protection guarantee. It does not require the dubious support of a substantive due process doctrine. With Roe now overturned, Congress may at some point exercise its authority to place certain limits on what states can and cannot do about abortion. The immediate effect of Dobbs, however, is simply to return the question of abortion regulation to the states, which is where it was through the entirety of American history until the Supreme Court imprudently and unconstitutionally decided to seize control of the issue in 1973. Among critics of Roe, there was and is a dispute about whether the court should have done more than what it did in Dobbs. While some believe that the justices did exactly the right thing in treating the Constitution, which says nothing explicitly about abortion, as silent on the subject, others think the court should have interpreted the 14th Amendment's guarantee to all persons of the equal protection of the laws as forbidding elective abortions. Again, these are abortions that aim precisely at bringing about fetal death. They are not procedures which are necessary to protect the mother from a pregnancy that gravely threatens her health or life. I was among those urging the court to take the additional step. Why? Again, the reason is simple. The historical evidence is overwhelming that at the time of ratification of the 14th Amendment, the publicly understood meaning of the term person included the unborn at all developmental stages. This is clear from medical, legal, and other texts, from statutes and judicial decisions, and from the campaign, successful throughout the country, led by the American Medical Association and supported by 19th century feminists to strengthen and extend historic common law prohibitions of abortion to protect unborn children. A key driver of abortion legislation in the 19th century was the emergence of modern human embryology. The foundational event was the discovery of the mammalian ovum in 1826 by the biologist Carl von Baer. Prior to then, the biological facts of human embryogenesis and early intrauterine development were matters of speculation. Figures such as the pagan Greek philosopher Aristotle did the best they could in the absence of anything that we would today count as scientific evidence. But the best they could do was more or less to guess. Aristotle, whose works heavily influenced Jewish, Christian, and Muslim thinkers in the Middle Ages, imagined that life in the womb began with a merely nutritive soul, like a plant, which was later replaced by a sensitive soul, like non-human animals from worms to rats which was finally replaced by an intellective soul, making the developing human being fully human. This idea underwrote the concept of delayed hominization, which modern science has completely exploded, but which also led to speculation prior to the rise of modern science that a living human body could be unensouled. But by the mid-19th century, all decently informed people knew what science had by then firmly established, that human development was a gapless process by which the living human individual, fully a member of the species Homo sapiens from his or her conception, developed from the embryonic into and through the fetal, infant, child, and adolescent stages, and ultimately into adulthood, 
with his or her determinateness, unity, and identity fully intact. Later scientific discovery did nothing but confirm and deepen that basic understanding. In Dobbs, however, the Supreme Court did not go so far as to give effect to the original public meaning of the term person at the time of ratification of the 14th Amendment by setting a limit to the right of states such as New York and California to decline to protect unborn human beings as they protect others. These states can, if they wish, and to my great regret it appears to be exactly what they wish, permit and even pay for the killing of unborn children by abortion until the very point of birth. What the court did in Dobbs was establish the authority of all states to enact the policies their people believe are right. The decision took the courts out of the business of imposing one policy, a universal right to abortion, on the entire nation. And that is all it did. I'm Robert George for the Amir Stein Center. If you want to see more content like this, make sure to like, share, subscribe, and hit the bell notification so you don't miss any new videos.